by things. <laughs> to the people of Parabudu and Karima, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm incredibly honoured to share my story with you today. <laughs> today I'm going to be sharing my struggle with postnatal depression, depression and an anxiety disorder, as well as postnatal. And how I use health and fitness um, to heal and support to help me forgive. So let's start at the beginning. Sorry, <laughs> it's just going to get a little touchy. I was just making sure I was in the room. When I was a child, I didn't grow up in a happy home. My father was a chronic alcoholic. I witnessed things that no child should ever witness, but they are not my story, so I will not go into them. At the age of 12, I became his victim when he started sexually assaulting me. <clears throat> and I did what any child would do. I didn't tell a soul. I was afraid. I, <clears throat> I knew what my father did when he got angry, and we all knew not to make my dad angry. I still remember him fronting me and saying, don't tell your mother I touched you. At the age of 14, my parents had separated and I got the courage to tell my mother what had happened. This was one of the hardest things I've ever done. What if she didn't believe me? What if she got angry? All these things would run through my head. And I still remember sitting there and trying to get those words out and they just wouldn't come out and my mum was getting very frustrated with me. Come on, Sky, say it, what's going on? <clears throat> but she did believe me and she would put a timetable of my abuse together. You changed so much, my baby girl. I knew something wasn't right. You're, <clears throat> you're always such a daddy's girl. And then all of a sudden you glued yourself to my side. For two years, I did what I could to keep myself safe, <clears throat> which was never being in the same room alone as my father. And I started sleeping in jeans, jumpers, a sleeping bag wrapped in my doona in the middle of summer. Sometimes this worked, sometimes it didn't. Upon this, she asked what I wanted to do, to leave it or press charges. I wanted to press charges. Actions have consequences, right? I prepared myself to stand up and tell everyone in all little details of what he did to me, only to have my lawyer turn around and tell me not to bother. You won't win. <coughs> I wouldn't win because I didn't take notes of my abuse, what the time was, what bed sheets I had on my bed, what was I wearing. Shit. Who takes notes of that? I was heartbroken. Out of fear, I kept my mouth closed and it was my fault. So I did once again I could to keep myself safe. I buried my shame and I was old enough that I didn't have to see my father, so I didn't. I cut him off completely and I cut his family off. But the pain and anger always stayed with me. I was bullied through high school and I was a cruel joke to some of the boys. I did things I was not proud of. And at the time, I didn't realise that the link of relationships that was formed by father-daughter bond was broken. So my idea was love as well. In short, I used my body and I allowed my body to be used. This meant they loved me, right? No, I was a joke. This behaviour continued through my teenage years. <clears throat> I self-harmed and I was suicidal. Anything to take the pain away and I'll be at peace and I wanted that pain to go away and it'll all be over. <clears throat> at the age of 21, after leaving an abusive relationship, as a cycle of learned behaviour continues, being broken down bit by bit until there was nothing left, my ex had introduced me to the world of drugs and I began to use crack cocaine and ecstasy in this relationship and continued afterwards. Eventually, everything we push down comes back up. My drug abuse has led to a complete mental breakdown, severe flashbacks, nightmares. I nearly crashed my car. I nearly lost my job. My passion for hairdressing, I nearly lost it all. My name through the mud, all because I couldn't keep myself together. I said, this is enough. There is something wrong with me. It was at this time I had written a passage on my mirror. I don't remember doing it. I just remember scribbling and I woke up to find, I am strong, I am a fighter, I will not back down no matter how hard it gets and I will no longer live in fear. This was my awakening. I went to the doctor where I was diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
depression and an anxiety disorder, and I was sent off on a mental health plan to see a clinical psychologist. <clears throat> In my first appointment, he asked me if I wanted to take medication. I said, no, I've been self-medicating for years. I don't want to take medication anymore. I want to be well. He stated this is good, that if I wanted to be on medication, he couldn't see me and would refer me on. In our sessions, he said I needed to find a sport or join a gym, and we went through the benefits of exercise with mental health, but it was not going to be easy. I had just now met my husband, AJ, who at this time had said, come with me to boxing. The trainers at this gym had learned my story and what I was going through. They looked after me incredibly well, and they could always tell when I wasn't having a good day. And one would always take me for a walk, let me cry, let me scream, <coughs> anything I needed to get out before I was going back into the crowd. Two years in therapy, relieving my pain, learning how to manage my flashbacks, the nightmares. I was taught self-hypnosis, what my triggers were and how I could manage them making sure I stayed clean. My doctor had said you'll never be fully recovered until you learn how to forgive what was done for you. I couldn't do it. I couldn't forgive someone who couldn't admit fault. My, my father's favorite saying was, I don't remember it, so therefore it didn't happen. So I progressed as much as I could, and that was acceptance. I accept that my abuse was not my fault. It was not my shame, and his punishment was that he doesn't get to be a part of my life. My father didn't walk me down the aisle. He didn't know I had kids until later, but my anger and my hurt was still there. That anger that I thought would never go away because I couldn't learn to forgive, but I learned empathy of others. As I managed to get a handle on my PTSD, my anxiety, my anxiety disorder came into full play. My anxiety was so bad, I was hospitalised with heart pain. No one knew what was wrong with me. I would see doctor after doctor and no one could figure it out because all the tests came back clean. I finally seen one doctor and she turned around and said, there's actually nothing physically wrong with you, it's in your head. So in short, my head was telling my body it was sick. I was prescribed anti-anxiety medication. I filled the prescription and I went home and stared at it until AJ had come home. He took the box from me and said, you have come this far, you can do it without this, and took them away. Another rock bottom, another kick up the ass. So I fought with myself every day to go to work and it was a hard fight if you could imagine waking up every morning feeling so nauseous you need to vomit but forcing yourself to put your makeup on to get your hair done and walk out that door at this time one of my close friends wanted to get fit and she wanted me to come with her <coughs> it was her cousin's gym and dragged me along i have a massive fear of gyms i know i know you guys all don't believe that right now <laughs> <laughs> I still remember hiding behind her for so long, but I met the personal trainer there that changed my life. I was very open with Isla, and she helped me overcome my fear of group fitness and one-on-one -on -one training. I fell in love with training with Isla, and I progressed, and I slowly got healthier again and became less afraid and started joining work again. In 2014, I gave birth to my first child. I couldn't go to the gym. A severe reflux, a severe colicky baby, I could only, and at FIFO husband, I could only go once a fortnight because Denzel couldn't be on his back. When Denzel was six months old, I was diagnosed with PND, postnatal depression. Given my report and the fact I'd battled so much without medication, I was given one chance and one chance only. If I didn't, <coughs> if I didn't improve, medication would be forced upon me. And another fight begins. To this day, I still remember my baby screaming in his bassinet while I sat in the corner of my shower and cried. As time and time again, I had to put my safety plan into play. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> the judgment I got from others when I tried to reach out. I had stated, I started to make changes I needed to get myself healthy. One of those was moving to Parabidou so I could be with my husband home, had my husband home, sorry, and the support I needed. I could get back to exercise. I was still afraid of going to the gym alone, but I started with the classes that were running at the time. It took me to have my second child to stand up and do what was right for me and my children and to screw off with what everyone else had said. 
In 2017, I was approached by Lifeline WA. For those of you who don't know who Lifeline is, they're a, a charity organisation for suicide prevention and depression awareness. <clears throat> to do a photo shoot campaign for their, um, or their campaign at the time called Self Made Heroes. People have used fitness as a method to heal. This was an amazing honour to be such a part of an amazing campaign. When I was interviewed, I, uh, they asked me, what, why do I do what I do? My goal, my passion is to give others a voice, to have them not be afraid, to be strong, that their abuse was not their fault. They have nothing to be ashamed of and to speak out, as too many of these people get away with horrible acts because, of, because they use fear as a method of control. I know, I was one of those people, so afraid, brainwashed thinking the abuse was love. I've lived through crippling depression and anxiety to mothers, to be a mother's listening ear as I tried to reach out when I wasn't coping. I told people that close to me that I wasn't coping, I was struggling and I was told to get over it. I was met with anger by others whom struggled to fall pregnant and I was treated like dirt because I wasn't coping as a mother. If it wasn't for my health nurse who kept a close eye on me and had seen the changes, the one person that gave what I was going through a name and that I wasn't complaining. For too long, people have been shamed for suffering with mental health and forced to suffer in silence. Mothers are judged, victims of abuse, too afraid to speak out. In April 2017, my little brother had, pro had approached me and asked if he could share some family photos with our father. That initial fear came back. But I stood my ground and I said, one, if he wants to see photos, he can ask me himself. And two, I want an apology. Because really, at the end of the day, that's all I ever wanted was an apology, him admitting what he had done. He took that knowledge and passed it on <sighs> to me. Around this time, I was speaking with a friend and the subject had come up again and how I would never fully be able to heal until I could learn to forgive. She had stated that it might be pointless for me to wait for an apology. Did I really ever think it was going to happen? But I really wanted to move forward just to forgive and let it go. I chewed on this information for months, fighting with wanting to heal and being stubborn. Now, another way for him to get away with what he's done was what I thought, but really all I was doing was just poisoning myself. Christmas time, my father had actually made contact with me and wanted to catch up and have a talk. So many emotions ran through me all at once, anxiety, fear and anger. It's taken you nearly a year to contact me. You know you did something wrong. I stood strong and I agreed that the next time I was in Perth, I would let him know, even though every fibre in me wanted not to go through with it and just hide like I'd done for years. I kept true to myself and I set up a meeting, which was in June 2018. I wrote notes of what I wanted to say and prepped myself for the single hardest thing I'd ever done, confronting my biggest demon, my father. The confrontation was so hard, I was shaking and I was crying. His new wife was there and I honestly expected him to stand up and call me a liar and say he'd never do such a thing. I said what I needed to say in tears. I had to explain what PTSD was because he didn't know <sighs> and what he did to me in the middle of a restaurant. My father says to this day that he cannot remember. When I stated that I understand that you may not remember the amount of abuse you put your body through over the years, there's a possibility that you will never remember. <clears throat> But I looked him dead in the eye and I said, do you believe what I'm telling you right now? Do you think I'm telling you the truth or do you think I'm lying to you? I got back. I believe you, Sky. I see the trauma written all over your face and I know I put it there. And I'm so sorry I put it there. So I took a big deep breath and I did the one thing I never thought I could do. I forgave him for the hurt he caused me and I let it go. I have never felt so strong and so free. Nearly 20 years of holding on to pain, anger and anxiety, all had lifted. I was liberated and I was healed. My father has asked to rebuild a relationship. I have stated that you have my forgiveness, but not my trust. 
you have to work for it. And I can say that he is working. We have had a couple of meetings and now he's met my husband. He is yet to meet my children, but we will get there. I wanted to become a personal trainer to help people in similar situations to myself heal and overcome fears. I want to be a safe place for people. My passion within the fitness industry is strength training and boxing. Boxing is my first form of healing and strength training is what I love, as it is important for me to feel, feel strong, both physically and mentally. At the end of the day, we all have the ability to heal in any way we need, whatever it is right for you. You just have to want to put the work into yourself to do it and you have to willing to fight with yourself every single day and it's a hard fight. My advice to you today, have a support network, people you know you can lean on at times. I have a, <clears throat> I have a couple of very close friends that no matter what I was going through, were always there. My amazing distant team who within the last two years have helped me push me to reach my goals. The things I have learnt through my battles, that no amount of trauma excuses you for being a shitty person. I have lost countless people in my life for my behaviour. It was when I hit my breaking point and I started to get the help I need that the people close to me stayed. I have a very supportive partner, but at the same time I'd stated I was getting help when we had met. And that the saying that holding on to hate is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It's truth. And to anyone on the outside, listen for cues from your friends, what they are telling you. Have a conversation with them if you are worried and think they may benefit from extra help and support. Thank you for listening to me today. such an um, inspiring story of facing um, your courage, owning your truth and I think one of the biggest fears here today is it's one thing to get through your story, it's another thing to stand up in front of everyone else and share such a personal, personal story because it's very different to think it and want to share it but to actually share it takes courage as well. So thank you for speaking your truth and inspiring us to find out.